to welcome you all to today's DS lecture, um, and especially welcome to Gareth uh, Billboard, uh, who is an historian with special interest in British welfare state history and with uh, emphasis on public health, including the vaccines. And uh, Gareth has been a DS fellow here since February. Um, Gareth Billboard is originally trained as a historian uh, with a from Warwick University and holds a PhD from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, which is maybe not the most usual place for historians. Um, and before arriving to uh, DS in the beginning of, of this year, he, he held uh, different uh, postdoc positions at the two uh, uh, already mentioned institutions and uh, at the University of Birmingham. Um, and I mean, I'll not walk you through all Garrett's publications here and in, in detail, uh, but just mention that he has published three books, um, one called Vaccinating Britain, Mass Vaccination and the Public Since Second World War by Manchester University Press in 2019. And the same year you uh, was co-authoring uh, the book uh, Placing public, the, pu the Public in Public Health in Post-War Britain, uh, by Paul Gray Macmillan, and now you have a forthcoming book, I guess this autumn, mm -hmm. I guess? Yep, September. In September, uh, about the sick note, uh, a history of the British welfare state uh, at Oxford University Press. And as a DS fellow, uh, Garrett is uh, associated with also Department of History, but I guess uh, given his work and interest in topics like public health, I think there should be ample room for cross-disciplinary cooperation and discussions. And uh, today you will talk about uh, welfare abuse or abusive welfare. I mean, not only looking back on work you have done already, but also presenting using upcoming research agenda topics you are planning to work on in the future. And I think you'll probably say more about this in a few seconds. But I think, I mean, by presenting research plans rather than research accomplished or published, uh, I mean, I hope this also allows for more debate and more discussion and dialogue. I mean, especially on how can the ideas you have maybe be developed also in a cross-disciplinary setting as, as uh, DS. But uh, Gerard, I'll give the word to you and happy, uh, looking forward to yeah. hear what you're Thank going you. to tell. I think you are mic'd up already. I think I'm mic'd up already. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you all hear me? You can. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Klaus, um, and thank you for unrealistically raising expectations, I think, <laughs> what's about to happen. Um, so before we get into the talk... This is about me trying to introduce myself to all of you, because I've only been here a couple of months, and I'm trying to outline the kind of work that I want to do while I'm here. So there's kind of a research project that I'm going to talk about that I can probably do because it follows the kind of things that I've done in the past. It's the same sort of historical work that I do that has an eye on different disciplines, borrowed from those disciplines, but is the kind of, I am the, the sole scholar in my office having big thoughts about things that might happen and then writing them up and getting the publications. But I think there's also something else here that is, it, it is interdisciplinary. The questions, I think, need to be answered in an interdisciplinary way. And I want to take advantage of being here in a not British university, but also in a very explicitly interdisciplinary setting. So the, what I'm about to talk about is sort of outlining that. Um, so one of the ways that I've tried to do that is to think about the conversations I've had with some of you in this room, in corridors, going to some of your talks, and thinking about the way that you think about things. So some of your names might come up in this. So one, I apologize if you think that means that I'm forcing you to work with me. That's absolutely not the case. This is just examples of the kind of things that I want to do. Two, if I misrepresent your work, I apologize. That's because I'm ignorant. There was no malice intended, and I apologize again. And number three, if I don't mention you, exactly the same thing's going on. I just complete brain fart. Do not take that as a slight. I'm just trying to, uh, trying to work through this. So all of those caveats out the way, uh, let's begin. Do any of you know who that is? Yeah? No? Some yes, some no? Okay. That is Martine McCutcheon. Uh, if you do know her in this country, she's the one that gets off with Hugh Grant at the end of Love Actually. I don't know if you've seen that film. Yeah, she's the, she, yeah, she's the aide. Um, she's also a very good singer. Um, and in the early 2000s, she played Eliza Doolittle in the play My Fair Lady, and she won awards for it. 
Um, but about halfway through the run, she gets a sore throat, um, which means that she can't sing to an international standard, obviously. Uh, and she also starts developing symptoms of exhaustion, uh, what is later diagnosed as ME. Uh, and she has to take time off from the show, and eventually she retires from the show. And the British tabloids, being the British tabloids, as I'm sure you're aware, start calling her Sick Note McCutcheon. So this is the link to my Sick Note work that I was doing before. Um, and then she commits an unforgivable crime. She is seen in a restaurant having a nice time. How dare she have a nice time when she should be working? This is the British attitude. So um, she starts to get even, even more hostile um, press. So Nick Curtis in the London Evening Standard said that uh, Martin McCutcheon gets exhausted. That said, he seems to be a certain type of celebrity. He always gets plum tuckered out and he's snapped falling over in public. You know, the pop star, the MAW, the model, actress, whatever. Those who are famous for being famous. Those, in short, whose lives seem to be a constant round of parties, award ceremonies, and premieres. You never heard about Mother Teresa in the Priory feeling stressed, despite being at the service of God and the poor 24 hours a day. Margaret Thatcher used to have a quiet week every now and again, and sleep only five hours a night while running the country, but you never saw her slumped on the Downing Street steps. So this is the British tabloids, and the way that the British talk about work and people missing work, especially if they're high-profile uh, women. Now, there were some people in the press that were a little bit more sympathetic to Martin McCutcheon, and the culture critic Mark Lawson in The Observer was a little bit more sympathetic. Unfortunately, he linked this sick note story to the other story in the news at the time of somebody who had given a medical excuse for missing their obligations, uh, Slobodan Milosevic's war crime trial in The Hague. So I'm not entirely sure that comparing those things was necessarily the most useful uh, way of doing it, but he did point out that we do have uh, a problem believing people when they tell us that they are sick. And the, the nickname Sick Note for Martin McCutcheon really had been around for about 10 years, and the first person and the most, uh, the most uh, sort of, the person that gets this nickname the most uh, is this guy here, he was a, a soccer player in England called uh, Darren Anderson, um, who, uh, was called sick note in, in part, I think, because by calling somebody sick note, you're talking about these millionaire entertainers and you're giving them a very diminutive nickname. So it kind of conjures up these ev everyday, uh, you know, the, the nickname doesn't work unless it conjures up some kind of everyday images of what's going on in British society and British workplace and everything else. Uh, and with Anderton, he said in an interview in 2016 that uh, I had a migraine and was throwing up before a Portsmouth game. The next day in training, someone laughed, oh, sick notes here. Nothing came of it until I joined Spurs and had that first groin problem three or four years later. One of the press boys who'd covered Pompey picked up on it, and that was that. But since we're here in a European university, uh, I do want to point out that this is not entirely a British phenomenon. Uh, you might know this soccer player, ex Bayern Munich and France forward, Frank Ribéry, who spent quite a lot of time in his later career in Bayern uh, injured, and so the German fans called him Crank Ribery, which is German for sick. Uh, it's, a, it's a German pun. Uh, yeah, so yes, they do have jokes. Um, that's for Victoria at the back. Um, this mat material comes from my last project, which was Sick Note Britain. Uh, I was interested in how the British talk about sickness and how they talk about missing work and how that played out in welfare state history. So what's the actual note that you get from the doctor and what is that used for? But also, how do people talk about it, rhetorically, metaphorically? What is the phrase sick note doing when it's in the pens and the mouths of British people? And what interested me about it was how it sat at the meeting point of so many different elements of past and present day welfare practice. It's about doctors, it's about employers, it's about employees, it's about social security, economics, the media. And it was the kind of project that if I'd had more resources and more people around me, I think, would definitely have become a collaborative interdisciplinary project on absenteeism in general. Uh, but as it was, uh, it was me in my office. So it became a kind of a meta history, really, of how all of those different fields understood each other relative to each other. And whether I pulled it off or not, you can find out in September when the book is released. Um, but my work to date really has been about those cultural attitudes that I've just talked about relate to some of the wider welfare state policies, because I believe that the two feed into each other, and it's important to understand both and the way that they interact. 
Sometimes it's not an obvious cause and effect, but there is usually currents going on at the same time. Um, so at the same time that Darren Anderton and Martin McCutcheon are being called sickness, Britain is also having a very involved discussion in contemporary politics about sickness, disability, and work. And in the early 1990s, the Conservative government tried to reduce the number of people claiming out-of-work disability benefits, with the Prime Minister John Major here saying that, frankly, it beggars belief that so many people have become invalid. And he may well have been right. Um, we see here that the, the amount that is being spent on out-of-work disability benefits goes up massively during the 1980s, and there's no evidence that there was actually any greater morbidity in the population. That is, the, there weren't more sick people by our other measures of that. Uh, but as Peter Van Heist said in his Meet the Chair session uh, last month, um, disabled people who had been employed were now unemployed. So it's not that there's more disabled people, it's that there's more unemployed disabled people because of the economic changes that have happened over the 80s and the 90s. But because that's happened, people start talking about the rise in the number of disabled people, and then that becomes a political issue. So that's why Britain, it's one of the reasons why people in Britain are talking more about disability. There are other factors, of course, disabled people themselves have become um, more organized and able to press for their own civil rights, and that's, that's a big sort of um, social change that happens over this time. It happens in America as well with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, but these are, the, these are the changes that are going on uh, in Britain at the time. So, this is the early 90s. Enter Peter, he's now Lord Lilly. Uh, and Lilly was made the Minister for Social Security after the 1992 general election and was a hardliner on benefits. And I want to play his speech from the 1992 Conservative Party conference because it's got a lot of tropes um, that I want to sort of really pick apart in a historical way. So I just want you to remember here, he's just won a five-year term. This isn't electioneering. This is him gloating and playing, playing to the gallery, really. Oh, yeah. This summer, I announced tougher rules affecting so-called New Age travellers. Most people were as sickened as I was by the sight of these spongers descending like locusts, demanding benefits with menaces. We are not in the business of subsidising scroungers. And we've tightened up on bogus asylum seekers. It's right to help genuine victims of persecution but not those whose persecution is fraudulent. And it's outrageous when people claim using a dozen different invented names. So we've clamped down on forged claims. And already, nearly 20,000 have evaporated into thin air. But there are scores of other frauds to tackle. So, Mr. Chairman, just like in the Mikado, I've got a little list of benefit offenders who I'll soon be rooting out and who never would be missed. They never would be missed. There's those who make up bogus claims in half a dozen names and councillors who draw the dole to run left-wing campaigns. They never would be missed. They never would be missed. There's young ladies who get pregnant just to jump the housing queue, and dads who won't support the kids of the ladies they have kissed. <laughs> and I haven't even mentioned all those sponging socialists. I've got them on my list, and there's none of them be missed. There's none of them be missed. So I'm going to go through the detail of that because this is going on YouTube and I don't want you to uh, get a copyright strike. So this is, this is direct um, source criticism, so it's fine. Um, so um, Lily talks about closing down the Something for Nothing Society as if people who claim benefits have never paid tax, will never pay tax, don't currently pay tax, don't, through their general existence and participation in society, contribute to that society. Uh, he takes a shot at travellers, which continues the long-standing British tradition of abusing the Irish. He takes a shot at asylum seekers, who it's this usual um, trope of, okay, we'll take all the genuine 
asylum seekers, but not those fraudulent ones. And then when you dig into it, there's no excuse that could possibly be given um, that these people will accept. Um, he takes an attack on fraudsters and benefit, benefit offenders. He wants you to think of these groups as automatically suspect of being that um, uh, before they've been given a, a chance to, to do their, their claim. He talks about councillors running left-wing campaigns, which is a reference to, in the 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of the large cities in Britain were the local council was run by Labour. Obviously, the government is Conservative. And these Labour, um, these Labour uh, urban areas, they do these horrible things like run ad advice centres for gay people or community events for immigrant communities. You know, really horrible, horrible things that they're doing with, uh, with public money. Uh, he talks about single mothers. I mean, you know, you've got to have an attack on single mothers if you're talking about uh, benefits and absent fathers as well, which in this case isn't as racially charged as it would be if this was an American politician, but that is certainly still there. And I'm sure um, Cecilia's work on, on the family and everything kind of ties into uh, some of those, those kind of areas. He talks about sponging socialists, which, you know, uh, but he also talks about spongers, locusts, and scroungers. So he's trying to make sure, along with bogus claims, that you associate all of these things with something. You're, you're almost illegitimate by the fact that you've even tried to claim, and we're going to root out what it is that is wrong uh, about your claim. And so that's my jumping off point, really, from the, the sickness work and thinking about disability to thinking about these things more in the round. Um, and uh, because everything in that speech is far from new, and I'll, I'll go through some even deeper historical examples of that in a minute, uh, but I think it also touches on so many aspects of human behavior across the world, many of which are being studied here at SDU and in Dias. Of course, there's the, there's the Danish Center for Welfare Studies and the political group in the, in the history department, and I think that's my natural home, so to speak, for the work that I've been doing. And, and thank you to everybody who works there that's engaged with me uh, so far as I've tried to think through some of these things. Um, but there's also uh, thinking about some of the sort of crossovers. There's Heidi Val Jonsson's work on refugees and asylum. I think when you combine that with the work on geosecurity that James Rogers is doing and the general work being done by the climate cluster that's in this building, uh, it, this is clearly an issue that isn't going to go away. This is, this is a, a very live issue. Uh, and a lot of these arguments are still being made uh, in Britain and in elsewhere. Lily's also implicitly talking here about the motivation of poor people to work their way out of poverty, and we'll see some more explicit examples of that in a minute. Uh, but that makes me think to Nikos and Tumanis' paper from last month. It's not just a question of how do we motivate people, which I think is a really interesting kind of uh, psychological and sociological uh, kind of uh, issue to think about, but then there's also how the very concept of motivation can be weaponized against certain groups by certain groups, and what, how do we think about that ecosystem that's going on there? Uh, and I think there's also this question of cognition. I'm thinking about um, Suna Bork Stephenson, Ed Baggs, and Anthony Fernandez's work with the DS Minds group. If people are labeled as uh, poor, or they, s they experience their own poverty, they see and experience other people's poverty, how do those issues interact with each other, and how does that sort of make people think about what their options are, either in terms of the people that are making these rules, or the people that have to live with these rules that have been made? Uh, and I'm sure there's lots more work going on here that I haven't even begun to think about yet. So uh, we've been going on for about 15 minutes here. Let's actually get on to what this presentation is about. Uh, it's about, I think, what my discipline and the kind of history that I do, um, can, what I can bring with my disciplinary background to these kind of questions about what is welfare abuse and how does it operate. But I also want to then take that a bit further and think about what I can't do because I'm a historian. Uh, and how an interdisciplinary or a, co a more collaborative look at these questions might be able to answer these questions in, a, in maybe a, a more satisfying uh, way. And I have no idea whether I'm going to pull that off, but we will, we will see over the next sort of uh, 20 minutes to half an hour. So one thing that I want to make clear before I get into some of the historical examples is I don't, as a historian, I'm not really that bothered about whether welfare abuse actually was happening or not. To me, that's not necessarily the interesting thing. Um, there are also other people working on that at the moment. Uh, Steve King, uh, not that Steve King, he's a historian at Nottingham Trent. Uh, he's currently, uh, he's got a, a big uh, grant at the moment to look at the question, so what evidence is there that there's actual welfare fraud going on in Britain? And he's taking that back to 1601. Um, his preliminary findings are that there's a lot less than people claimed there was, but I don't know what his results are going to be, and I don't want to prejudge them. But for me, what's more interesting isn't what's really happening. It's people thought that it was happening, 
and the thought that it was happening motivated them to take political action. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in how the thought of welfare abuse has political power, not necessarily the abuse that's happening. Now, of course, there must be, I say there must be, there probably is something going on that some of this is based on what you and I are going to consider data, um, but some of it isn't. Some of it clearly isn't. It's based on cultural prejudices about poor people and about various other different groups. Um, and to show that that's a, an evergreen historical issue, I'm going to take two, two examples from two debates that are set 100 years apart. And we're going to start in the 1870s with the Charity Organization Society, or the COF. Are there any Victorianists in the room? Am I going to be able to get away with being really, really basic here? Good. Okay. So, to be insultingly brief, in the 1860s, uh, it becomes clear that Britain's poor law isn't working. Uh, it was originally designed in the 17th century to help people in the local parish, the kind of the area around their local church. Uh, but mass urbanization meant that some of those early modern parishes now had tens of thousands more people than when they were initially set up. Uh, and some of those are overpopulated, um, and there is grinding poverty in those areas. So you've got some areas where you've got many more people, but they can't possibly raise enough tax revenue to pay for the system as it has been set up. Uh, and in the late 1860s, there's an economic collapse leading to what we now think of as unemployment. So there's several issues going on, and people have got various different ways that they think it ought to be uh, solved. So for some, the, the issue is that poor need to stop being so lazy and they need to work their way out of poverty. This is an individual problem, and the poor are the ones that are going to have to take that on. Um, but for others, there's a clear problem with the system, either because it can't provide enough money to those who, and this is a very loaded term, deserve support from the state, that there's not enough money to even help the people who we agree it's not their fault, or because it puts burdens on some taxpayers that it doesn't on others. So if you're a middle-class person living in a not-poor area, you're going to have to pay less tax to cover the poor law than if you're a middle-class person in a poor area, which causes all sorts of problems that I'm sure, um, I'm sure you can sort of follow the logic through on that. So the Charity Organization so uh, Society, which is set up in the late 1860s and becomes active in the 1870s, uh, has a solution. And its solution is that you need to make the poor want to work their way out of poverty. And this is built on the ideas of Thomas Malthus and other eugenicists, and there's this idea that the poor are poor because they lack effort, uh, and that that can become a genetic trait, that you can breed laziness into people if they live their life this way generation after generation. And the way that you get people out of these situations is you encourage them to work, and you encourage them to be thrifty so that when they don't have work, they still have enough um, to be able to lean on. That's the, that's the idea. Um, so it, the, it's the state's role to give as little help as possible, because if the state gives too much help, it's actually being abusive, because you're not giving these people the incentive they need to uh, better themselves. Uh, and where the CRS goes even further is that they argue that what you need is the good local Christians, the middle class Christians, need to work as social workers. They need to go into people's houses, see how they live, and educate them about how they might live their life better. And th this, uh, this book on the screen here by Robert Humphreys is a really good introduction to all of that if you are uh, indeed interested in, in this group and, and some of the way that their ideas outlive them um, in a way. And the important thing is that that fear trumps all other considerations. So this is, this is an article here by Crossman and Lucy uh, where they show that the British state wasn't even willing to give out um, much aid during the Irish famine, where I think even the most staunch uh, sort of uh, what we now think of as right-wing uh, politicians didn't think that the Irish suddenly became lazy overnight and didn't grow enough food. This is clearly an economic issue. This is clearly uh, a... Uh, uh, dare I say, an, uh, an ecological issue. Um, and yet it was thought that actually if you help these people too much, they're going to become reliant on it and it will just perpetuate uh, the problem. And I think anybody who knows anything about the history of Ireland knows uh, the result of, of all of that. Um, and again, not all of this is built on what we now think of as hard evidence or data. It's based on foundational myths. Uh, and a great example of how that, uh, of how that manifested uh, as a driver of policy is over life insurance for children. So, uh, in Victorian Britain, life expectancy isn't great, um, and 
uh, funerals are expensive and they are important as well as, as a sort of a cultural uh, matter. So in order to be able to afford funerals, quite a lot of uh, working class families took out life insurance on their children so that if the worst happened, at least they'd be able to give them a good funeral. Middle class people thought that would just give an incentive for working class parents to neglect their kids, have the kid die early and make a profit on the insurance. Um, because apparently working class people don't love their kids is the, the, the argument. Now, there is no evidence whatsoever that that actually happened. And Daniel Gray in this um, article goes looking for that evidence. And there's none. Um, it is about four cases where insurance is mentioned at all in the, in the case. And it's not the primary motivator behind what has happened. But you get a series of laws from the 1870s right through to the First World War designed to restrict parents, especially working class parents, access to life insurance, including paying the insurance directly to the undertaker. So there's absolutely no chance of the parents making a, a profit on this. It's, it's ridiculous. But anyway, um, and Humphrey's book as well has, has more examples of that. But let's go 100 years into the future, into some of the work that I've done some more primary research uh, on. Uh, and uh, a, a lot of these concerns remain the same, although they're often dressed up in a different language and some of the emphases are different, but you see some of these tropes um, continuing. So this here is called the Fisher Report. It was commissioned by the Conservative government in the 1970s as a result of fears that over the 1960s, there'd been an increase in the number of people claiming benefit and that some of that had been abusive. It couldn't all be, uh, you know, apparently Britain is getting richer and it's getting more healthy and yet more people are using the health service, more people are claiming benefit. How do you explain that? Well, it must be abuse. Let's look into it. Uh, and again, you know, the Irish uh, turn up as a specific target of, is there something with Irish uh, immigrants? Are they particularly involved? But then they also look at uh, some of the other groups that have become bigger in British society over that period, particularly immigration from uh, the Caribbean and uh, South Asia. And that's a specific thing that they look at. But what I love about it is that they requested evidence from the general public. So we have a tranche of letters from British people to the government complaining about the welfare system. Some of them complaining about the fact that it's not generous enough. Some of them complaining that obviously it's too generous. And I know a guy who did a thing and, you know, that kind of anecdotal uh, evidence. And what I love about this is this isn't just government prejudices, therefore, or charity prejudices. We get to see other people's prejudices as well. And I think we get a, a deeper sense of what might be um, circulating in British society at the time. Uh, and there's this letter that I love partially uh, because it comes from the same part of the country that me and my family are from. So it's a middle class person from Warsaw, which is a town just to the north of uh, Birmingham, uh, relatively uh, poor, highly industrialized, but with pockets of, um, of middle class kind of um, uh, business people um, in the area. And this guy's taking it upon himself to provide evidence to the government of people in his town abusing welfare. Uh, and he says, and I'm going to do the accent so you understand what I sound like when I'm with my parents and not trying to be a middle class British academic. So he says, uh, I was very pleased to read that you are taking some action against the layabouts of our society. For some years now, I have been most vociferous about the abuse of the social security systems in Warsaw. My concern is shared and indeed often voiced by the editor of our local weekly paper, the Warsaw Observer. Some time ago, I reported two blatant cases of men receiving supplementary benefit whilst working. After clashing with local officials over their refusal to take action, I wrote to my MP, and finally to the Prime Minister, Mr Wilson. Mr David Ennals, your predecessor, called for a report from the Warsaw office and then declared there was not abuse of the supplementary benefits in Warsaw. And this, of course, was arrant nonsense. So the government investigates the guy's evidence and finds that in almost all cases he's just wrong. There's one guy who at the time he was alleged to be um, defrauding the system was in prison. Uh, and there's another guy who is working while getting benefit, but it's because he's just been released from the, the local psychiatric facility and he's doing therapeutic work in the community. So yes, he's receiving benefit because he's not being paid because it's not a proper job. It, anyway. Um, there's like one case where he's actually right and the system already knew about him anyway. So, but anyway, I think there's something inherently amusing about that kind of John Cleese-esque kind of character, busybody. Um, but while that's funny, 
there's also examples from people who are claimants themselves who are clearly in a very difficult position, but have also internalized some of the narratives about the poor and they think about it of themselves and it's also clearly causing them issues as they go through um, the system and then they write to the commission to say these are the things that are going on. So uh, this is a woman who simply signs her letter unwanted spinster uh, living in Glasgow uh, in, the, uh, in the 1970s and she says, uh, please excuse my writing you re scroungers who live on social security benefits. I am a single woman, I am a single woman living alone. I was made unemployment redundant four years ago, and owing to my age, 58, and not being able to do very heavy work, I find it hard to get work of any kind that wouldn't entail heavy lifting, as I've got a plastic valve in my heart, and my sole income at the moment is my five pounds unemployment benefit. Not being in arrears with my rent, and having nothing on the higher purchase system, I couldn't claim social security benefit. When I did apply, I was told that with not being in arrears or up to the neck in debt, but if I lived within my means, five pounds was quite plenty for anybody to live on. I'm very glad to read from today's paper, which I get handed to me from a neighbor, that you are going to investigate further into the matter and see who are really needing the benefit. If I and others like me put ourselves into deep debt and squandered our meager income on drink, bingo, and smoking, no doubt we would get benefit from all sources. But because some of us want to keep our self-respect and independence, we get nothing at all. Believe me, sir, if I could get light employment of any kind, I would very willingly take it, as I don't like the idea of being kept by the country. Once again, I hope that you won't be annoyed at my writing you, but I thought I would let you know my side of the story. This is clearly somebody presenting themselves in a kind of like a subservient kind of way and saying, look, I, I need this benefit, and the reason I'm not getting it is because of all these scroungers over here. It's, it's a very mixed, it's a very difficult letter to read, actually, and try and interpret sort of all these different things uh, that are going on. Now, it is, of course, very important to read an archive like that critically. And I'm thinking there about Brian Yazell's work of using <coughs> flash fiction to try and get at people's ideas of what they think about climate change. I think there's something similar going on here to do with, um, to do with uh, welfare abuse. And I, I, I need some help from people that are better at interpreting those kind of texts and linguistics uh, than me. I'm sure that there might be some overlaps there. Um, but again, we find myths. We've obviously got... Um, our boy from Warsaw, um, but we also we also see that there's there's modicum of evidence backing some things up. So the reason they're investigating Ireland is because there's an agreement between the Irish state and the British state that citizens from both countries can claim on the other's social security system without needing to have built up the usual residency. So there's some evidence that some people who understand the really minutiae of the system, some evidence that those people are able to find they're able to claim sickness benefit in Ireland while they're working in Britain, things like that. Um, but very, very little of it's going on. But again, I'm not so bothered about how much of it's going on. I'm bothered about the fact that enough people thought this was going on to write to a royal commission. Enough people in government thought it was going on to set up a royal commission on this. So how is it that these beliefs about uh, welfare uh, and how are they circulating in British society and how do those things mix together? And so that's my jumping off point, really, for asking more involved questions about those processes. Uh, and I want to work, if I can, if people are willing to, you might not after this, uh, be willing to apply some different interpretations to the material uh, that I already have. Uh, but I can also, I think, understand from other disciplines there might be questions that I'm not even thinking of asking and that might be worth um, asking about the historical uh, archive. Um, and I think, importantly, this isn't just a British question. Uh, we also have in the United States the clearly racialized and misogynistic attacks from various groups on what uh, Reagan called welfare queens. Uh, we have the very long name that I cannot pronounce, child benefit scandal in the Netherlands from a few years ago, uh, where the Dutch authorities deliberately and fraudulently targeted families where one of the parents wasn't Dutch, and that actually ended up bringing down uh, the government. Which kind of leads me to ask that in using the excuse of combating welfare abuse, can welfare states themselves become abusive? And how, how does the welfare state itself get accused of being abusive? Uh, which I have seen in uh, Sweden, for example. I was reading a, uh, an article from 2001 where um, Swedish feminists in the 1990s showed that Sweden didn't provide enough protection 
to women who'd survived domestic violence, various ways that the laws kind of protected the men more than they did, uh, more than they did the women. And so they accused the Swedish welfare state of being abusive by not providing the protections that it ought to have provided, which led the defenders of the welfare state to say, well, how can you say this, given all of the maternity pay that we give you and the fact that you live in this, um, this egalitarian society? Everybody agrees that Sweden's great. And so they called these women sex racists. Not entirely sure where that's come from. Uh, but th these sort of these accusations of abuse and these accusations of ruining the welfare state, they're not just top down. They're all over the place. I'm trying to think about how that might play out. Uh, and then, of course, closer to home, uh, we have uh, very recently had the uh, apology from the, uh, the Danish government for the abuse of the Greenlandic children who were taken from their homes in a sort of giant social experiment to try and uh, educate them to be able to run Greenland uh, and in massive scare quotes properly. Um, and I'm sure there's countless other examples, and I'm thinking here of uh, Klaus's work and, and Marie's work uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the report into the, the Danish government and the historical abuses in, in psychiatric care. I think there's clearly, clearly work already being done in this area that uh, is worth, worth, worth working with. At this point, I'll have a little bit of water. Um, so what I've outlined so far, I guess, is what I would work on as a historian. That's my... Working package one is the stuff that I already know roughly how to do. If, if everything went wrong from here on in, I'd at least be able to get a couple of uh, publications out of this, probably. But I think there's a working package two uh, that I need to work on as well. Uh, basically, I need a, more, a better conceptualization and more interesting ways of asking the question, what abuse is? And to try and explain that, I'm going to uh, completely rip off uh, Anthony Fernandez from, uh, from your talk uh, in March. Um, Anthony said that uh, ancient Greek philosophers asked, what is beauty, not what do ancient Greeks think beauty is? So from my professional perspective, I can only really go at that latter question. Um, I might mix it up a little and say something like, how did ancient Greeks' ideas of beauty change over time? Um, but as a historian, there's no real room for me to ask a question like, what is beauty? Because to me, in my discipline, beauty is always context-specific. Context there's no such thing as beauty. We live in a very bleak world. That said, I always bring theoretical concepts to the work that I do. Um, historians always do that to try and explain the past and understand the reasons why historical actors believed in certain ways. Um, so, for example, if I wanted to look at the British Empire and I was interested in the relationship between um, the, the metropole and the colonies, I would have a theoretical con concept of racism, but while understanding that the way that racism manifests in 1920s Britain is not the same as it is in 2020s Germany or 1950s Denmark or anywhere else in the world. There's something specific about the type of racism but I still need a concept of racism to be able to properly interpret what's going on. And then we have our usual debates in our journals about who's right and who's wrong. You know, basic humanities kind of um, research. So I think it's important to learn from and work with other disciplines to see how they understand abuse. And given those definitions, what new questions can then I ask of my work? How can the findings that I get from the archives feed back to those disciplines that I'm working with and help them to generate new hypotheses? And I think that, to date, has been the thing. Whenever I've been in an interdisciplinary environment and I've been working alongside colleagues who come from different historical traditions or different methodological traditions, I've always uh, found it really useful for generating new hypotheses. But there's a difference between generating a hypothesis and actually coming up with a research question together and tackling it together. That's the bit I think that I need to do more of, uh, and hopefully at some point can work out some way of doing that with some of you here. I think it's often easier proposed than done, uh, but I think it's something that I should at least attempt while I have this opportunity um, working here. So I'm just going to outline a few categories of abuse that I do want to talk about, um, because these are the ones that constantly come up in the literature. If you search abuse, in uh, historical abstracts or in a sociological journal database. These are the kind of topics that keep coming up and thinking about what kind of implications there might be from that. Absolutely not an exhaustive list, illustrative. Um, so first, you always come up with ideas of interpersonal violence, that abuse is an act performed by individuals on other individuals. It's a crime, usually, uh, at least morally, if not legally. 
Uh, and it seems particularly relevant to legal studies, ethics, present day practitioners in uh, the welfare state, philosophy, behavioral studies, and various other groups. So how do those fields define interpersonal abuse and how do they understand the power dynamics involved between survivors and perpetrators? Uh, and what might we be able to learn by what is and isn't defined as abusive in the past? Because some things that we think of now as abusive might not be at different points in time or space. And how can we sort of understand that? And from there, how do those individual abuses or behaviors manifest at the institutional level? So we saw that in some of these historical examples that I showed. But if we take something like the Me Too movement, for example, we saw a lot of articulations of individual acts of abuse, but they were often linked and connected to the power dynamics of the historical development of, for example, the film industry, the police, institutional care, academia, and various other sort of, uh, sort of groups. And again, to reference Klaus and, and Marie's work, we, we, we see that playing out there as well. Uh, and again, how can some of those collective approaches to abuse allow us to reread some of the material that's coming from uh, the archives? <coughs> also, interspecies violence. Quite a lot of stuff comes up about animal, animal cruelty uh, and environmental uh, damage, which is often framed as a, an abusive act. Um, you see that a lot in historical and sociological literature. And I was interested then in thinking through some of the work that I've seen done uh, here on climate and uh, Ed Bagg's talk from last month on the Anthropocene and the relationship between common resources, but the moral imperative to ensure minimum standards for all. And in some ways, that's exactly the point of the welfare state, albeit it's a mo much more obviously man-made structure. But the, some of the power dynamics that are going on there, I think, are, are very similar. And I think it's especially interesting as we're entering an age now where welfare states are explicitly seeing the environment as something that they have the moral and legal uh, authority to act upon, to protect the environment, to uh, legislate for those things. Obviously, there's been environmental protection for hundreds of years, but I think it's very specifically being framed as the climate now. And that might be worth uh, looking at. So basically, how do we manage common resources? Who gets to use them? Who is supposed to contribute to them? Uh, are we being abusive if we allow certain citizens' quality of life to dip below a certain minimum? And is there a way in which we stop that dipping below a certain minimum that can itself be seen as uh, abusive or not abusive, depending on the circumstances? Um, but there's also self-harm and self-abuse comes up quite regularly in the literature. Uh, and I think this is interesting when uh, a lot of the actions that individuals take are then related to uh, the community. So, for example, uh, once we know that smoking is bad for us, and we've known that really as a society since at least the late 1960s, depending on uh, which uh, scientists you, you believe, um, how does society deal with those who are labeled as smokers? Or, and you can do that with any other drug as well. So there's a number of people here working at diet, uh, DS on exercise and diet. So given what we know is collectively true, about the amount of activity we ought to do, the things we ought to eat, the things we ought to not eat as much of, at what point are certain behaviors considered self-abuse? And what gives certain groups the moral or legal authority to intervene on that individual's behalf, either because of some kind of calculated economic cost that if taxpayers all contribute to the health system and somebody is using that health system more and their behavior is clearly a contributing factor to their extra use of the health service, is that an abuse of welfare? Or is it an abusive state that has allowed somebody to get to that point? Is it an abusive state if they do stand in because people have individual liberty and should be able to live their lives roughly how they want? All of those sorts of questions. And abuse often comes up as a motivating factor for why people do or do not act. And I'm trying to think about some of the implications that that might have for present day practice, but also how I see that playing out in the historical uh, literature. And all of that really uh, is about the identification and management of risk. But it's not always clear to whom that risk applies. Um, is it the country's finance, a particular vulnerable group, a specific individual? And how do you manage, and how in managing those risks, do other risks then come about? So I'm reminded, uh, my friend Jenny Crane, uh, who did her PhD at the same time as me at Warwick, uh, worked on child abuse in Britain. Uh, and she gives this really good example of how Given the safeguarding that has been put into uh, public spaces and in private spaces in Britain, children are clearly at a much lower risk of physical and sexual violence than they were 50 years ago. That's 
pretty undeniable. But the same forces that did that have created a bureaucracy and a suspicion about certain adults that means that large numbers of people, particularly men, do not want to be involved in any way in doing any kind of community activity for children because either it's a lot of paperwork or people automatically assume that you must be a bit off if you want to work with other people's children. This is a major problem in, in British society. So on the one hand, children are safer, and yet on the other hand, there's clearly all these other risks that have happened because the child is missing out on certain other um, aspects of their well-being. So that needs to be picked apart, and I think there's been a lot of work on the risk society since the 1970s. I don't want to rehash that here, but I do want to say that a lot of these things about safeguarding and about protection from abuse we're seeing them way before the 1970s when supposedly the risk society comes about. So I just want to say, this isn't just me whining about neoliberalism again, as is my, my usual uh, grift. Um, some of this stuff is happening way before supposed neoliberalism um, and probably will happen way after as well. And how do we understand the way that, the way that these risks are thought about that aren't necessarily, necessarily in actuarial terms or in terms of how we now think of the risk society. So that's a lot, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to end with uh, Martine McCutcheon again. So partially as a result of her hounding by the media, her underlying issues with ME and exhaustion got worse, that she was accused of abuse in an abusive way, and that actually made uh, the supposed problem worse. But she left the public eye for a while uh, and is now making a comeback. She was on the uh, 2021 series of The Masked Singer. And we're here in Orensa, the home of uh, Jose Anderson. So uh, this is uh, somebody who was bullied turning into a beautiful swan. So I know you like those kind of uh, stories. And um, yeah, it, uh, the, the other thing was that this is, um, people that are accused of abuse can be done in an abusive way. The people aren't always abusers. People aren't always abused. There's, there's lots of different directions in which these accusations and power dynamics are going about. And that's one of the things that really fascinates me about this topic and one of the things that I, I think, or I hope, uh, some of you might help me a little bit with trying to unpack. And she also looks very, very happy in this photograph. So uh, I think I will leave it there. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for a very interesting talk and lots of things to discuss. Um, so, people with questions, Christine? Yeah, I, I, don't care. Yeah. I loved your presentation and it was so relevant to so many things that I'm doing right now, so I can't, I would, I could talk for the rest of the <laughs> hour about that. So, I, I really want to make it short and just say I think the things that you were talking about last year about the risk society and the uh, sort of derived uh, harms of trying to prevent abuse uh, is super relevant to what we are studying in terms of, of vaccines and other health interventions and how you may prevent a specific disease, but you may actually cause uh, non-specific effects on other outcomes. And really that what we want to measure, and that's of course super difficult in a society, societal context, is the overall net effect of, of whatever we are doing. Um, um, yeah, so I, the, coming back to the talk I gave just a few weeks ago, some of the things, these rules that we apply, these policies that are uh, put, uh, put down on people really ought to be tested also in randomized trials, uh, cluster randomized trials, starting policies in one region, I mean, in this case to, to prevent abuse, uh, but not in other regions, and, and really measuring what is the overall impact, not only on, on, on uh, the abuse you, you're, you're targeting. Uh, one very recent thing that I'm really upset about, uh, and I don't know it's if it's too recent for your research area, but that's how we have handled vaccines in the context of COVID. And, uh, and what happens when you have uh, a government, a society that, that mandates, or at least quasi mandates uh, a health intervention for which you, which you don't have very good data um, to uh, to a population and and the way it was m talked about was so that Michael Bang Peterson from from Aarhus University just uh, has a paper in, in pipeline or uh, almost published that shows that 
the prejudice against the unvaccinated in the Danish society was 2.5 times higher than the prejudice we have towards other races that we normally would uh, have mm -hmm. a lot of prejudice against. Uh, so, so, I mean, really saying something about how the way we talked about the people who weren't vaccinated was uh, imprinting on people's perception as, as here are the people who are really abusing our uh, health system and even going down to people talking about, well, if you don't vaccinate, then you should not be allowed to be treated in hospital or you should pay for yourself. So I think that's that's uh, a, a very recent and perhaps two recent uh, yeah. examples. But yeah, and, and then in the contrast, the way we treat the people who now have side effects from vaccines, because this is a group, I'm just doing a podcast series right now, talking with several of them. If you come and say, I have the vaccine, I actually think I have side effects, then you are also treated as somebody who's abusing the system. You're trying to... Uh, cast doubt about the vaccines, you're casting doubt about our societal model and how we handle COVID, which was brilliant, and you're maybe out for some kind of uh, financial support that you, you aren't really entitled to because you're just making this up. So we have created really, uh, even among the, the vaccinated, there's also another group which is highly stigmatized and, and suspect mm -hmm. of being abusive. So, yeah, I'll stop there. No, it's... Uh, I. I just had a uh, conversation with a, a law professor in Durham about this. Um, there was a um, there was a news story came out uh, earlier this week that uh, a number of people who uh, oh. claim that they've had side effects from vaccines have even got the cause of death on the certificate as a reaction to vaccines. Given that we knew all the stuff about uh, or it became known about the clotting issues that could happen in certain populations from some of those certain vaccines. All of that's been accepted, uh, and yet the vaccine damage payment scheme in Britain has not paid out to anyone yet, um, despite, despite assurances from the Prime Minister. Can you believe our Prime Minister being a liar? So he, uh, he, he's been interested in this question for a while, um, because there's virtually no transparency in, in that system at all, and hasn't been for a while. And we, we we talked about it a little bit actually before um, COVID um, because some of my early work I did on the vaccine damage payment scheme and how it got set up. And in that situation, it was people that could relatively clearly show that it's highly likely that there was a link between the two. Obviously, you can never prove it, which is the other. That, that's the reason that nobody ever gets compensation through the usual legal systems is it's so difficult to prove it that under normal legal circumstances, you wouldn't. So the whole point of this scheme was to try and build confidence in the vaccine system was to say, it almost certainly won't harm you, but on the off chance that there's even any suspicion that it has, here is an insurance payment. That's how much we believe in this system. That's what it was supposed to be. What it's turned into with COVID is how can we make sure that we just don't spend anything? And if we even admit that one person was damaged, does that bring down the entire system? And it shouldn't if the risks of the vaccine were made clear in the first place, because there's always no medical intervention of any kind is going to be um, safe. We know from all the statistics that we are much safer from having done this in so many different ways than we would have been if we hadn't. But that doesn't take away the fact that there are downsides. This isn't entirely, uh, yeah. So that is a question that I am very interested in. We should probably talk about that at some point because I think there's, there's certainly, uh, certainly I think the history of that scheme informs the British response to it. And this is, this is a very live issue in Britain. Um, so yeah, I don't think I've got, um, yeah, I, I can I can respond with a uh, an, an eight thousand word paper to to, to that, but uh, yeah, we should yeah we should definitely talk. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Um, I have two questions. So one thing it, you, um, during this presentation you talked about welfare abuse, and I was wondering what about welfare fraud? Is there a sort of distinction there? There's a, because that would be what I would have. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that was one question, and then the other one was you talked a lot about media and politicians and how we talk about welfare abuse, and you say you don't really care if they're they're actually abusing the system or 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 a fraud, right? Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you are also interested in um, in exploring how uh, municipalities or how state interventions have been set in place to actually avoid or to discover uh, yeah. these frauds yeah. or, or abuses. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. So on the first one, uh, I think welfare fraud is where you can actually prove that somebody has knowingly and deliberately broken the rules and taken stuff that they weren't entitled to. But the rhetoric of abuse is slightly different in the sense that there's lots of people um, where it is claimed that, okay, technically they qualify, but that's not the sort of person that should be getting benefit payments. They, they must be on some kind of, you know, they found a loophole or, um, yes, okay, technically you can take unemployment benefit for X amount of time, but really you should have got a job earlier and it, you're, you're playing the system. So there's sort of a, there's a difference, I think, between what people morally say people should and shouldn't do and what people are legally required to do. I think it kind of comes back to this. I mean, in Britain, you were never legally obliged to take the vaccine, but there was so much societal and political pressure to take it that, in effect, those that didn't were were stigmatized. So there's that kind of distinction. Uh, in terms of how people, um, how these uh, governments try to tackle fraud, yes, I'm very interested in that. And that, that was something that came up quite a lot in my last um, uh, project, where um, the ways that the six note system were built, it was designed to try and detect fraud. And there were all sorts of systems put in place to see, okay, if this person claims X number of times in a certain amount of, in a certain space, can we therefore say that they are highly likely to be somehow abusing the system and we'll go and we'll visit them and we'll see what they're, they're doing. I'm really interested in those kind of things because it kind of feeds into the, how you define what the abuse is, is going to define what your supposed solution to that is and especially in a really complicated kind of system like this. Um, in terms of just with social security in Britain, that's a national question. So there's, uh, although there are local offices, a lot of the policy is dictated from the center. So that's quite an interesting and relatively easy thing to sort of research because you, you go down to the National Archive in London, you read through your, your documents and suddenly you found the truth about the university. You know, you know how history works. Um, but I, I'm, I'm more interested, I think, as well in breaking away from my focus, which has mostly been on social security and thinking about housing, which is a municipal thing uh, in Britain, um, and thinking about some of those more sort of local services and thinking about which are the groups that are considered to be doing this kind of stuff. It's usually gendered, it's usually racialized, isn't everything. Um, but I think there's also, uh, there's also that question then of how those different groups maybe have different solutions. They clearly talk to each other about what those solutions might be, but do they have something that's specific to their local area because of the way things have panned out? So I'm really interested in that question now. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, I found this very, very interesting. And, and as you know, I, I don't do stuff like this, although I'm a historian. But I thought, uh, as I listened to you, that, that abuse, to some extent, is a rather blunt concept, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I, I wonder, I, I mean, you, you find it in the sources, so you would say that this is, this is an accurate concept. But as an analytical concept, have you any uh, reflections upon whether you should kind of construct a typology uh, mm. a variety of, 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 of abuses of, of in, in go in that direction? I think that is one way that I want to go. And Klaus can vouch for the fact that I've been scribbling all over my wall trying to think about what different kind of types of abuse have, have manifested, whether they were called abuse or whether they were called something else. Trying to work out what the relationship is between the person making the accusation and the person being accused. and Because it does seem to be a relational thing, but it's it's difficult to sort of pick all that apart. I think that is necessary. I think it's also something that I do need to borrow from social sciences and from philosophical um, literature as well, because it's, I, I can sort of come up with a rough meaning for what it might mean in the 1970s and do my usual 1970s stuff. But I, I, I want to sort of expand it out from that, because I think there's, there's, there's clearly there's a lot more going on than just that. I think the typology, the, the typology is difficult. That's what annoys me about it. But I think, I think it's worth spending the time trying to do that. <coughs> that has been, because if you just look for the word abuse, you're going to find kind of what you're looking for. And I think there's, there's more merit in finding the stuff that I wasn't initially expecting, the stuff that doesn't confirm your prejudices. And I think having a, a, a framework for looking at that might be a better way of, of approaching it. Thanks for a great talk, Gareth. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is a philosophical follow-up, actually, okay. of Ms. Arnes, without me knowing it, and we're sitting next to each other, but we yeah. didn't confer. Right, okay. <laughs> but I, it's going back to your uh, analogy with the beauty. Sure. And you said, I, 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 didn't t uh, I, I didn't actually take you, but I'm pretty sure okay. I heard you say that um, 
uh, you couldn't ask that question because there was no question of what beauty uh, was mm -hmm. apart from what the Greeks said they were. Mm -hmm. But from a philosophical point of view, that is a very specific uh, view on what beauty is, namely yeah. what people think it is. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I would like to challenge you to, uh, <laughs> well, do you actually uh, mean, uh, have this very relativistic understanding of abuse, not beauty, uh, mm. but of uh, abuse, which is what you're talking about, or, and that's where the topology that mm. uh, Nizan is asking for would come in, would that be philosophical, social, scientific, I don't know, ways of asking that question that goes beyond what people think there is, and which would actually, because I mean, my, uh, uh, my focus point is knowledge, and I have no problem in discussing the difference between what knowledge is and what people think knowledge yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, I was, I was blunt there. I also said there's no such thing as beauty, which is not what I believe. It's just that beauty maybe changes, um, and that just because something socially, socially constructed doesn't mean that it doesn't have real-world effects. I, I agree with you, and that, that was what I was trying, but I think failing to get across with the, the racism analogy was that I think, you know, if you want to do any kind of work on, on the British Empire, the way the British Empire talks about itself and its sources is not the way that I think a modern day historian would want to go back and look at the power dynamics and things that were going on in the British Empire in you know, the 1890s or the 1990s or, or wherever else. Um, so I think, I think that, is, that is part of what I'm struggling through, is the, the, the extent to which my usual kind of historical approach would be, okay, abuse is whatever they say it is at the time and let's see how that changes, versus let's have an idea of, of what we're going to go looking for rather than looking at the stuff and drawing out from that. There's, I'm sure there's some kind of induction, deduction kind of, it's been a long time since I did that literature in there. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think that is a, um, I think that, that, that's the benefit for me as far as I see it from working in an interdisciplinary way, is that other people have their typologies of abuse and I want to look at what those are. Is there a way of mixing them or do I take certain ones in certain situations to try and get a sense of meaning from what's going on? But I think, I think actually you've helped me a lot there because I think it's the sort of a light bulb kind of, ah, yeah, that is what I'm trying to do at the moment because I'm very early on in the project and I think that's probably step one. Once I've got over step one, then I can actually do something with it. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, time is running. So, I'll just uh, have a, like a very brief comment on this. I, I think what you touch upon is, is, is uh, I mean, with the topics here with uh, like abuse, moral hazard, these ideas, is maybe the key of the welfare state in a way that it is basically a social contract that is building on that people accept it and see it as legitimate. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, these are different ways of challenging it. Mm. And maybe that could be a way of, uh, say, if you want to have some kind of typology to see what kind of functions the word abuse have vis-a-vis -vis this kind of social contract. Mm. So I mean, every welfare law has built in some kind of criteria trying to dealing, deal with the moral hazard aspect. Uh, so that could be one. Another one could be that the welfare state as unintended consequences might ending up abusing people, as we, we have example on. So, so I think that could be an interesting way of operating and going into a dialogue with a lot of research on deservingness, uh, welfare contracts, I mean, social contracts. And, and so, yeah, yeah, just a brief comment. So, but uh, otherwise, time is up. Uh, I have to go, over <laughs> to go over here, so we will not be able to answer it. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, thank you to Garrett for a stimulating and very interesting uh, presentation and lecture. Thank you. <laughs>